I'm sorry to, uh, to once again, I think it seems my main role at this meeting has been to interrupt great conversations. And, and it's, um, I take it as a wonderful sign that here we are on a rainy, cold uh, Saturday morning, uh, still having very, very engaged conversations. Um, I, again, my name is Ken Ruscio. I'm the uh, chair of the board of AAC&U for another uh, six hours or so. In a minute, I'll introduce my uh, successor, Ed Ray. Um, I, I do want to offer just a couple of very, very quick comments on this, our centennial annual meeting. And um, it does cause someone in my position to be a little bit reflective on the last hundred years, but more importantly, the next hundred years. Um, I, I, I found myself a couple of times during the last few days thinking that we are, not to over-dramatize it, at a pivot point. Um, I couldn't help but think back to the last hundred years, what higher education was like in 1915, and what it is like today, the profile of our student bodies, the profile of our institutions, the profile of our faculty, profile of our curricula, and just really imagining really what it would be like in 2115. And then also thinking about the role that AAC and U played in the last hundred years, keeping liberal education right at the forefront, and thinking about the role that, liberal, that AAC and U can play over the next hundred years, and you have begun that process at this annual meeting, and you're to be congratulated for that. Um, I have, uh, let me do one housekeeping item, which was to, um, uh, which is to thank Task Stream once again, the featured sponsor of our 2015 annual meeting. I hope you've had a chance to meet the Task Stream team uh, during this meeting, and um, of course, in keeping with uh, technology these days, you can click onto their website through your mobile app, your AACNU annual meeting mobile app. Um, I also have the task this morning of uh, bringing you uh, good news and bad news. Um, I am not Freeman Hrabowski. Uh, these four individuals are also not Freeman Hrabowski. It takes a village to replace him. Uh, he is uh, bedridden with the flu. He called us um, at 2.30 yesterday on his way to the doctors, and his assistant called us at 3.15 after the doctor's visit and said he ain't going anywhere. So we quickly assembled an all-star cast, you'll meet them in just a minute, uh, to talk about the very, very important topic that Freeman was going to talk about. Um, in, in merging this equity imperative with the quality imperative. Um, I can assure you that that is the replacement, is the good news. Uh, these are four very, very uh, exceptional individuals on this topic. Um, we were able to tap into our deep talent pool to, to recover in a, a split period of time. But it is now my pleasure to introduce my successor as AAC new chair, Ed Ray. He was elected by the presidents uh, at the association's meeting yesterday. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ed. He is the president of Oregon State University, uh, where he has been since 2003. Uh, before that, he was at Ohio State University, which uh, someone corrected me yesterday. It is the Ohio State University. Uh, where he was in the economics department as chair and served as in uh, various administrative roles before going to Oregon State. I can tell you a lot more about his research, his background in economics, and all of the great things he's done at Oregon State. But let me just say simply that as a board member, um, I've come to admire his realism and his candor, uh, but also his vision and his principle. Uh, he'll be a great board chair, and join me in welcoming Ed Ray. Good morning. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Ken. And in the spirit of uh, candor, uh, these wonderful uh, colleagues have, are here to uh, uh, speak with each other and with you this morning. And 
I have the staff pulled together some uh, wonderful brief uh, biographical statements, which I have not had time to rehearse. So I'm reminded of Dwight Eisenhower, who did uh, uh, whistle-stop uh, speeches when he was running for president of the United States, and he was, he was notorious for never reading his speeches ahead of time. And at one of these stops, he made a very important announcement, and that was he looked at his speech, and he said, and I promise you, if I am elected president of the United States, I will go to... Korea. <laughs> so, history was made. Hopefully, I won't do any such thing. Anyway, it's wonderful to have you all here. Uh, you know from the discussions we've had earlier in our sessions that AAC and you intends to devote its centennial, centennial year to a broad dialogue with members and policy leaders about what we call the equity imperative specifically the critical importance of providing equitable access to educational excellence, also known as liberal learning. Not just access, access to excellence. We intend to do this for the nation's new majority learners, students more often than not from underserved and low-income communities who are the first in their families to go to college and whose hopes for the future rest largely on how well we prepare them for the future. So it's in that spirit that I'm really pleased to introduce my colleagues here today. First, on my immediate left, Brian Murphy. Brian Murphy has been president of De Anza College in Cupertino, California since 2004. Previously, Murphy was executive director of the San Francisco Urban Institute at San Francisco State University, a position he held after serving as chief consultant to the California State's legislature's review of the master plan for higher education in the late 1980s. Murphy taught political theory at the University of California, Santa Cruz, Santa Clara University, and San Francisco State <laughs> University, and has served on several city commissions, and nonprofit boards. He earned a bachelor's degree from Williams College and master's and doctoral degrees from the University of California, Berkeley, all in political science. In 2011, he was instrumental in the development of the Democracy Commitment, a national project aimed at ensuring that every community college student has an education in democratic practice. Janella Butler. Janella Butler served as provost and vice president for academic affairs at Spelman College from 2005 to 2014. In 2015, she will continue her scholarship and teaching as a professor of women's studies. Prior to Spelman, Dr. Butler held appointments at the University of Washington, Seattle, as professor of American Eth Ethnic Studies, with appointments in English and women's studies and Associate Dean and Associate Provost of the Graduate School, where she established an award-winning program. Prior to UW, as we call it out west, Dr. Butler taught early in her career at Towson State and was the first black woman to be tenured at Smith College. Dr. Butler's scholarship spans pedagogy, ethnic studies, and African-American literary theory focusing on identity, experience, and interdisciplinarity, relationships among democracy, diversity, and civic engagement in liberal education, and institutional change. Mildred Garcia, Millie. Millie Garcia became the fifth CSU board-appointed president of Cal State Fullerton in June 2012. Previously, she served as president of Cal State Dominguez Hills beginning in 2007, where she was the 11th female president and first Latina president in the Cal State University system. Prior to coming to CSU, she was president of Berkeley College in New York and New Jersey from 2001 to 2007, and earlier held positions at Arizona State University, Montclair State University, and the Hostos and LaGuardia Community Colleges of the City University of New York. 
An educator foremost, Dr. Garcia began her career as a faculty member. Over the course of her career, she has taught at community colleges, comprehensive institutions, and research universities. Dr. Garcia received a Doctor of Education degree, as well as a Master of Arts in Higher Education Administration from Teachers College, Columbia University, a Master of Arts in Business Education, Higher Education from New York University, a Bachelor of Science in Business Education from Baruch College, City University of New York, and an Associate in Arts degree in Legal Secretarial Sciences in Business from New York City Community College, CUNY. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that is very impressive. Charlene Dukes. Dr. Charlene M. Dukes is the eighth and first female president of Prince George's Community College. With more than 44,000 students at six locations, including the Largo campus, Prince George's Community College offers 200 credit and workforce development and continuing education programs. Appointed by Governor Martin O'Malley in 2007, she is currently the president of the Maryland State Board of Education. Prior to her presidency, Dr. Duke served as the Vice President for Student Affairs at PGCC. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in secondary education with an English concentration from Indi Indiana University of Pennsylvania and a master's and doctorate in administrative and policy studies from the University of Pittsburgh. And now let me turn matters over to Brian to uh, start us off. Well. <laughs> We didn't know whether it would be appropriate to give you uh, 25 seconds to leave uh, <laughs> with no embarrassment, you know. <laughs> you know, in France, everybody's wearing the Je suis Charlie thing, you know. Well, we're not Freeman. Um, and so we, uh, we didn't want to channel uh, him. But he is our colleague and friend in this work and, uh, and has provided national leadership of uncommon stature. Uh, in the bringing together of these two agendas. So we are saddened by his absence. And uh, on the other hand, uh, better he get well quick. Um, so he has our support and solidarity. Um, we wanted to frame a conversation and do it in the time allowed us. Uh, the pharmaceutical firm or, or uh, pharmacy group, CVS, <coughs> is scheduled to occupy this room at uh, three minutes after 11. <laughs> uh, so, so we're going to have a little exercise in evacuation strategy, <laughs> right? Right at 11, but we're not going to give them a damn minute before 11. Right? <laughs> Everybody get clear on this. So we'll go right to the, to the end. Um, the, uh, here's how, here's how we, we thought we would do this thing. <laughs> we got a call yesterday about... 5.30, and then we caucused this morning. <laughs> Extremely well prepared. Um, the, uh, the good news is that this is our life work. Uh, and the good news is uh, we couldn't hope uh, for three uh, leaders of very different institutions to help us have a conversation uh, about what actually works in bringing together these two agendas that have framed this conference. On the one hand, we have had a conference which once again affirms the centrality and importance of liberal learning <clears throat> as the nation's most needed and most valuable form of higher education in the face of a national narrative that is increasingly functionalist and reductive and uh, vocational we in all of our institutions from the community colleges to the research ones and the private <coughs> institutions have shared in the conference a commitment to this broader vision of what liberal learning can be. And at the same time, and as the twin theme of the conference, we have also been talking for four days about that other enduring and unmet agenda, which is providing <clears throat> access to the finest learning for those most marginalized by a culture and a society and economy which has deeply segregated our people by race, by region, and by class. I recommend for those of you who have not yet seen it, 
America's Unmet Promise, which is a report from AACNU by our colleagues, um, this really is a remarkable document. It is deeply sobering <laughs> by its account of the depth to which we have an educational apartheid and class segregation in this country that is enduring and indeed deepening. So the question before us was, in our institutions, as we live in them, what's to do? How to, pro how, how to proceed? So the, the query with which we thought we'd start was that from each of our very different experiences, my three, their different experiences, my three colleagues might speak to the ways in which institutions have actually and practically approached bringing together the equity agenda and the excellence agenda so that the two are not held apart. So we're just going to start, put a few things out there, then we'll have a few follow-up exchanges with each other. At a certain point, uh, we'll, at that moment, open it up to your, not so much questions, but suggestions, ideas, other things. Remember, the agenda is to walk out of this room <laughs> feeling <laughs> more deeply committed <laughs> to the idea you go back to your campus, armed with some ideas and some questions, for the next year, we will work on this issue. On my campus, what am I going to do to bring these two agendas together? I'm going to repeat that at the very end, but that's the charge and in some set what the setup of this conversation is. So let me turn immediately to my left, okay. Janella. All right, OK. <laughs> Well, when I saw the agenda for equity and quality coming together, I immediately thought of the work that has been going on, that was going on in the 90s and even previous to that. And I think that work was involved in moving us, moving us from access that we got in the 60s and the 70s to, a, to accommodation, they're here, okay, and they're here, to transformation. <laughs> And that was the dream that, that many of us had, was transformation. Um, the transformation being significant institutional change for uh, first generation students for, and for all students, so that their knowledge base would indeed prepare them for the world that many of us saw and envisioned that we're in right now. Uh, the world that needs innovation and to deal with complexity, but everybody being on board and every faculty member being on board, and having diverse faculty to be on board, all of those things. So moving from, so I tend to think of equity as access in a way, and bringing equity and quality together as the transformative moment. And I think we're there. I think sometimes we have to have a crisis, and we certainly have many crises. Uh, and so now we can move the agenda that we began in the 90s, and I think that where, why did that agenda stop, just briefly? It stopped because of right-wing um, um, opposition that was very, very, very strong um, against that agenda that stopped many foundations from funding the kind of curricular work and the kind of of faculty development needed for cultural pluralism in our curriculum, for community service to be enhanced in our curriculum, for the connections to be made in the liberal education and the world. So now we're at a point which we, we've got to do it. And I think this, this document really gives us the, the data to argue as to why we have to do it. Now, um, <clears throat> I came to Spelman because at the University of Washington and at Smith, there were, I think th there was a progression, and I'll, I'll be real brief with this. I, I saw in my career a pro progression that parallels the progression um, uh, nationally. So I was at a comprehensive institution, Towson, uh, chairing black studies in my first um, appointment and moving the institution towards looking at, at ethnicity, et cetera. Um, in the curriculum. At Smith, um, among other things in the African American Studies Department, looking to bring women's studies and um, black studies together around race and gender. 
So, that, so that's another whole conversation. But that's all part of this quality. It's all of what the student is learning. And then in the 90s, the statewide grant of, that the Ford Foundation gave us for including cultural pluralism into the curriculum. I'm stating this not as a catalog of what I've done, but of what we still need to do. It gives us a model of what we need to do on a large uh, scale. Finally, I came to Spelman because I chose to come to Spelman because I was so frustrated with what was happening to graduate students and how we weren't preparing graduate students for the, the liberal education that they needed to convey to students and how we weren't making the connection between their specialty and their liberal education. So I came to Spelman, a place of 2,100 students, 47% Pell eligible now, 353 first gen ed students, about 16%, all right, to really see what could happen there with a, with a, a liberal ed uh, curriculum in developing that. And I want to just point to two things that on, so I've, I've spoken about nationally and of what we can do now on our campuses, and some of you are doing these kinds of things. But the common read is so important to students, to use that as a way to engage students into the, into the curriculum, to broaden their sense of topics like immigration, migration, race and gender identity. Service learning becomes very important. Um, and is very important, has been at the core of Spelman's uh, curriculum. However, at the University of Washington and at other research institutions, I'm not just going to pick on UW, some of my colleagues are here, so they'll probably go, Janella, what are you doing? But anyway, um, it's just the nature of the beast in that of research ones, that service learning, community service, all of that is put aside in student affairs, is separate from the curriculum. And so how do we bring those two together? That's an agenda for those of you at Research Ones to think about. That would be transformative. Uh, global education, I've seen that really bring together quality and equity when you consciously do it at, at Spelman as part of our QEP. And so having students not only go abroad, have short study travel experiences and all of that, but to have specific discrete learning outcomes for that and to have blogs and reflective opportunities for students throughout the curriculum. So those are some of the kinds of things on the ground that I know you're doing, but you can think about them in the context of this equity and quality imperative, because then it, it looms larger and you see other things that can be done. And we, I'll close by saying we certainly need the support of, of foundations and others to really make sure that our faculty have innovation labs like we're giving our students, the innovation labs for faculty to think through all of these things. Let me say that part of what we mean to do is to call out that which is being done in very different institutions. Spelman is a very different institution than a California State University comprehensive campus. And then also begin to look for some commonalities of things that we might be able to do and that you might be able to do, regardless of whether you happen to be in one kind of institution or another. But Millie, you are in a very different place than right. Spelman. <laughs> um, very big with a very different mix, if you will, of first generation uh, students coming to your institution. What have you guys found as plausible ways of turning access into genuine engagement around quality? I think the first thing we need to do at our institutions is to make clear the issue. And I mean, it's just that simple and make sure that it's communicated. So for us, our strategic plan talks about a high, high quality academic programs to the students we serve, diverse students we serve by diverse faculty and staff, and then have strategies and ways that you hold people accountable to get to those areas. Because that's very clear. I was very surprised, for example, not only at Fullerton, but other institutions, when you ask them, who are your students? Where do they come from? What neighborhoods are they from? People don't know. And the mere fact of even asking, do you know how many of our students are graduating by disaggregating the data? But it's more than that. It's more than just knowing the data and knowing what they're learning but who's learning and who's not? Who's involved in the high impact practices and who's not? And how do you document that? So that in our strategic plan, we're calling for 75% of all our students will have two high impact practices, 
in the next five years. Well, how do you define that? How do you get the faculty engaged in having that conversation? And at a place like Cal State Fullerton, we have over 38,000 students or 4,000 faculty and staff. We've got to do that by colleges, by departments, and very important, work together with student affairs. We continue to have these crazy silos mm -hmm. where you have all of these individuals in student right. affairs having these wonderful support services, not engaged with academic affairs and our fabulous faculty. And for me, it starts from the top. I do not tolerate my vice presidents not working together. I said to them, it's not gonna work. It's how do you sit together to engage faculty and staff to work together and role model that behavior. And so because it's part of our strategic plan, it's also connected to our budget. And so the budget defines your mission and your passion of your institution. And so we put money behind our GE Pathways, for example. And the themes of our GE Pathways, global studies, power and politics, health and well-being. And you're engaging students in making sure that as they go through these GE Pathways, not only are they talking about this, they're in learning communities. And we, I don't have to tell this audience the importance of learning communities. And finally, I'm going to stop by saying we need to go out into our communities. We can't just stay in our institutions. And we have to be there listening to the voices of our students and having them on those committees, but also going into their neighborhoods. Many of you have heard me speak about this Hispanic fair, the Latino fair we had, all in Spanish, where parents understood the FAFSA workshop in Spanish that parents knew what it meant and what they had to do to get their student from the community college to the CSU and what was the pathway in Spanish. And when we did exit interviews, the parents said to us, the most important factor was, I did not need my children to translate for me how I get them through the college experience. And so we need to get out of our environment and mm -hmm. out of our ivory towers and walk into those communities and help them see that the university and community college and higher education is for them. Charlene, yes. Prince George's Community College. <laughs> well, the first thing I thought we could do is that if you are, are willing to take out your cell phones and take a selfie, that I could give you Freeman's cell number. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you don't tell them it was me. <laughs> but uh, uh, what I will tell you is that I think that if you understand who and what community colleges are, that you will recognize uh, uh, when you read uh, America's Unmet Promise and understand that by the year 2027, in many ways those students who are marginalized, who are underrepresented in higher education will become the majority by that time, then you will recognize that quite frankly that community colleges are the poster children for the very students, families, and communities about whom we are speaking. 93% of the students that I have the opportunity to serve are students of color. They are African American, they are Hispanic Latina, they are Asian Pacific Islander, they are Native American. 56% of them are first generation college, 65% of them are on federal financial aid. 68% of them are women. So we are talking about uh, the fact that every day we are serving students in, in the nation's 1,132 community colleges who really are looking for ways to engage and have a much deeper experience as they're moving through our institutions and on to many of yours. So how, how do we do that? And I think, more importantly, how can we do that? And I think Millie, Millie talked about the strategic plan and making it an institutional priority. But it doesn't just start, quite frankly, with, with the president or chancellor of an institution. It really starts with the governing board. You know, what, what, what is important to the board of regents or the board of trustees, those individuals who come there with a commitment to set policy that will guide the direction of the institution. 
So I think that that's one place where it begins. And how do you have those conversations and public meetings with the board? Uh, maybe privately first to gauge where they are, but then publicly to quite frankly lay down the gauntlet. And then I think it's also a matter of how do we hold each other responsible and accountable for it? How does this whole issue of meeting the equity imperative within this liberal learning context find its way within those things that I think are dear to us? How does the board evaluate me on meeting that mission and keeping that conversation current and fresh? How do I evaluate the senior administration? How do they then evaluate the administrators who are in their areas? And then how do we evaluate the faculty? How does it become a part of the criteria, quite frankly, for tenure and promotion and post-tenure review? I think that we have to look at it from all of those perspectives because if it's important, you know what they say, we measure and keep what matters. Absolutely. And how do we hold everyone accountable to, to that sort of measurement? And then, what is it that we expect of students? The one thing that we do know, and as we were having our sort of brief round robin preparing for this, is that when students know about these kind of social issues, they are ready to step up and be a part of solving the problem. So how do we ensure that within the work that we're doing on our college campuses every day, that students know and that we're encouraging them to go out there. You know, I know that many of us were out there marching in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, and how do we make sure that our students understand that it's important that their voices be heard and that we're not responsible for crushing their voices, we're really responsible for creating a platform where they can speak loud and clear and strong about what matters to them. The one thing I might add is uh, I was sort of looking out over the audience and realizing the multiplicity of roles that's in this place, in this room. Many of you are faculty, many of you are administrators and staff. Um, some few of you are presidents. Uh, there may be a few vice presidents. Uh, you occupy many roles. We tend, I think, in, in my experience, and I think it's shared by most of you, to define our work through those roles and in that way the institution invites more of a conversation about liberal education, liberal learning, what's quality, because we're used to that conversation or at least it's more familiar to us. I think with regard to the question of equity and, and not just access to but genuine engagement of students for whom this is a new part of their lives I think we have to begin to think of ourselves as organizers in our institution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who are our supporters? Mm -hmm. Who are our allies? Mm -hmm. If we meant to get to the space that Charlene just mentioned, that our boards would care about this and hold us accountable to it, how would we organize ourselves to have impact on that board? If, we are, if we're faculty and we know that the great majority of our colleagues are deeply involved in their own research, mm -hmm. in their own teaching, caring deeply about their students, but perhaps completely unknowing these broader dynamics. Not out of some willful ignorance, but just because it isn't what they've been paying attention to. How do I reach out to my friends on the faculty? How do I get them to take seriously that the country faces an economic, moral, ethical, political crisis of huge dimensions? we are on the front lines of a really serious issue of inequality. And so thinking of ourselves, whether I'm a faculty member or a president or a vice president, how, what forces are with me? What forces are against me, honestly? Who's indifferent yet? And how to move to build a consensus? And I wanted to sort of ask each of you, in each of your very different experiences, what advice would you have for our colleagues here about, about being successful at it, about organizing, about bringing a consensus together on campuses that are usually divided around these issues? You need to bring the stakeholders together. My president's advisory board, for example, does have the chair of the academic senate does have the chair of our planning resource and budget committee, who's a faculty member, does have the deans, does have my chief of staff and the vice presidents, but, and, and a student. 
our student government president. And we have these conversations. We bring in things like this. So this book will come back into that room and then they take it out. And so one of the things that I do at the President's Advisory Board that I think is really great is I challenge them to bring back an example on how they're moving it forward. So one of my deans came back very excited about how she got her entire college with the park to have a retreat. Who are the students? Who are learning? Who are moving forward? So now that college is really kind of challenging the rest of the academic deans to say, okay, what, am, what are we doing to get into the conversation? But it's bringing the, co the university together throughout the institution. I think at an institution where you don't have that model, um, it, it, it's very difficult because faculty have, um, in my experience at Spelman, and say, well, who are your students? And there's a shift occurring. They, we did have at Spelman years before um, middle class students, mostly middle class students. Now we have the first gens and we have students who we are competition, they're going to our competition, et cetera. But faculty are still thinking about the student that they had you know, the model 20 years ago, I think. So there needs to be a shift there. What, were I to be provost, or I would advise my provost, my, my successor, if she were, were, and she's a good friend, so I can talk to her about it, uh, to do would be to think about this document in ways that we um, <clears throat> transformed the curriculum to the Spelman integrated curriculum. And that is to have your teaching resource centers to use, have conversations about this document around who our students are, who our students are nationally, and where do our students fit in this, this um, scene here that we see. And then what is it that to identify then? What are we doing that addresses it? Okay, what are the, the strengths that we have? What are the challenges? Um, what does our community engagement look like? What does, which we pride ourselves on. Is it really doing what we think it, is, it, it ought to be doing in light of this kind of thing? So to engender those kinds of conversations, um, and I'll just end by saying that's how we transformed, worked with the curriculum, was having numerous working groups to have discussions about things and lead faculty in those working groups. And then the conversation moved to some action. And I think in, in um, our area, which is certainly here in the District of Columbia and uh, Maryland, we've taken, a, a, I think, a much broader approach with the Maryland uh, DC Campus Compact. So 80% of the two-year, four-year uh, public, private colleges and universities in Maryland and DC belong to cam Campus Compact. So we've taken a much broader approach in terms of the civic learning, civic engagement, using the principles uh, that are, are certainly the foundation of the work of AAC and U. And uh, just this year, we've also begun to partner with public school superintendents. Mm -hmm. So we're bringing them into the fold so we can talk about how do we continue this continuum um, focused on what students are learning and being exposed to in our public high schools. And I would dare say that before long, there will probably be a number of private high school entities that will want to come on board. But we have several um, forums that exist for faculty, for uh, senior administrations, for student services people, but they're all working together in that SAGE group mm -hmm. to say, how do we bring these experiences mm -hmm. to students? How do we talk about them on our mm -hmm. college campuses? And then how do we move from one campus to another so that we can learn from things that are happening someplace and I can figure out, well, how do, how do I adapt what they're doing to what we can do at Prince George's? How can our students interact with students not just from the University of Maryland College Park, but from UMBC, from American University, from Gallaudet University. So we're looking, we're, we've been engaged in this work probably for about three years, and the numbers of experiences that students have had, quite frankly, are in the thousands, and what they're bringing to us every day about the things they're concerned about and how colleges and universities can help push that agenda for them. Now, the one thing we did at De Anza about eight years ago, we had a strategic planning exercise that involved over 100 of our faculty meeting over several days. And we began it by having a demographic economic analysis of the Silicon Valley region. 
uh, both an account of the economy as we imagined it was going to change, despite the fantasies in Silicon Valley that everything is always brand new and you can't predict anything. Um, <laughs> You can, in fact, predict some things, but uh, what would that look like? And then much more importantly, we did a very careful uh, analysis of the demographics of race and class in the Silicon Valley region so that we could identify the communities where there was the deepest need for higher education. There were the least current levels of involvement in higher education. And the strategic plan was then, and I urge any of you who are place-based in, a, in the way we are as either comprehensive universities or community colleges to do this kind of analysis. Because what it did is it focused us on very specific communities where there were very low enrollment rates regionally. And we're one of eight community colleges, but we very aggressively went after the communities that had the most deep and significant need. That meant bringing to the campus in a very affirmative recruitment way students who were less prepared I mean, just very clear about what the consequence of this was going to be, which then meant having to have a curricular conversation internal to the institution about what will we now do. We have embraced these newer students. Uh, to be very specific, we doubled the enrollment of Latino students in the space of four years. Uh, and students were coming from very, very underfunded, stressed high schools. So we looked at the students and said, these are very competent, very bright young people who have not been very well prepared uh, by my state's chronic underfunding of their schooling. So how are we going to work with them to ensure that their experience of coming to college does not make basic skills developmental education some pre-collegiate embarrassment? No, it's actually at the heart of what this place does, and we respect it, and we honor it. And so for our faculty, you know, who may be teaching British 19th century literature on the one hand, we've got pretty creative people thinking, okay, how do I do basic skills, you know, in composition that's substantive, that does, that meets the framework of, of a quality liberal education? That's very exciting work. For faculty who recognize the beauty of those students and who understand what it would mean for the bridge to exist between what the high schools were able to give them and what the university will expect of them when they transfer, um, that's, that's extraordinarily difficult but very rewarding work. So I, that is a concrete suggestion. For those of you who are, are, are located, if you will, uh, differently than institutions that have national, if you will, recruitment for students. Um, knowing who the communities are and, and very aggressively thinking through the consequences of recruiting to access, mm -hmm. rather than just, hey, you know, I'm going to go out and get folk. No, actually, we're then going to have to engage ourselves in how to be respectful and honest about what it takes to then be very successful. Those two things can operate very powerfully. It does require, in my experience, and I, I, this, is, this is real, it, it, it requires what I would call faculty organizers. Not just, not just faculty leadership, but again, members of the faculty who see this work as critical and whom you support in ensuring that they have the meetings, organize the retreats, mm -hmm. get people into the tough conversations mm -hmm. where people can talk about their, their uh, as yet unrevealed biases, their fears, their anxieties about the new majority. You can't have that conversation, you can't move forward. Brian, could, could I just jump in for one thing? Absolutely. None of us really, we are talking about diverse and underrepresented students, low income students. We haven't talked about diversifying our faculty and staff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an extremely important thing if we're really talking about inclusive excellence and the importance of bringing together this new faculty with the, all of these retirements that are coming. Mm -hmm. And so we are working on that and we've tried something new at the C, at least for the CSU. We've created an office, our HR person was an associate VP. We made that person a vice president for human resources, diversity and inclusion. And that person is now on the cabinet and works in partnership with the vice presidents. That vice president is the support. They're not gonna hire faculty, but they're gonna do the legwork for the departments. Where are the diverse people 
graduating with those degrees? How do we do proactive recruitment so those individuals know that we're interested? How do we sell Cal State Fullerton as the place to be with this 55% first generation students and over 60% students of color? And this is this institution and you're gonna have a wonderful experience. Faculty and, and chairs and departments don't have time to do that. You need a partner to go out and do that legwork and then introduce people to where those wonderful people are, where they're graduating from their terminal degrees. So I put that on the table. It's, it's an really experiment. We're it's going really forward, point. but I think, and then we t we're holding deans and directors responsible. What kind of recruitment are you having? Is it diverse? Where are you going out? Or are you just sitting there putting an ad in the paper and hoping people will come to you? Mm -hmm. right. And I think the other thing is that these are tough conversations. Nobody said it would be no. easy, <laughs> but I, I believe that we all are in the roles that we're it in, sure quite frankly, in order to sit at the table and have them. There are days when I go home and I feel bloody yet unbowed <laughs> because I say, oh, I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> we ain't finished yet. So, and, and I think that, that that's Absolutely. really what it is and that, you know, we have okay. formal leadership, we have informal leadership. Mm -hmm. We have those folks who we know are champions and you make every opportunity that you can to make sure that they're sitting at the table too. And then I think we have an obligation to listen to people's anxieties and say, well, let, let's figure that out. I tell the senior administration at Prince George's, contrary to what you believe, we are not the smartest people or the only smart people at the institution. You know, we have a lot of them and it's our obligation to bring them in, listen and learn. And there are many times when I, I think in my head, you know, I never thought about it from that perspective. So now that changes how we will attack or address the issue. And it, they're, they're hard conversations, but if we're not willing to have them in institutions where we believe that we represent what I would call the supreme democracy of what it means to be educational institutions, teaching and learning, um, not just our students, but ourselves, where else could it happen in, in the United States of America? Where else? So I want to say to add to all of that, I hope you're feeling how huge this is because <laughs> <laughs> and and we should begin I just want to tag onto this about faculty or new faculty orientation and one place where we could deal with this use this document would be drawing from that so our new faculty are coming in understanding that but I don't want to leave here without saying something that really is an aspiration uh, because it's so hard and that is um, the content of what we're teaching is so important. Once you get the students in, once you have your faculty, as you were describing so well, working with them so that they are, are better prepared and they, they meet the, the, um, the skill level that they need to have, they can easily be turned off in a classroom. This has nothing to do with pedagogy. By what you have them read, by what you value, um, I'm talking about racism in the classroom. I'm talking about ethnocentrism yes. in the content. I'm talking about how do we, and the big conundrum I'm trying to figure out is, and, and I hope a whole lot of people are trying to figure out is, with the kind of curriculum demands that we have now. We never had the, the liberal education you know, that moves, they learn this, then they learn this about the world, et cetera. But how do we recreate in some way the history of ideas Ben Franklin was talking about that all our students would have some sense of why they're here, why the nation is where it's at. That's terrible, I'm an English professor too. Um, <laughs> why, the, <laughs> why the nation is where we are. Um, <laughs> Boy, Freeman Robowski owes us a lot. Yes, yeah, he, he does. does. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, so, so that they have a, a good sense of, of the uses of literature, of imagination, mm -hmm. of all the things that, that, that we valued, said John Henry Cardinal Newman valued in, in liberal education, all those kinds of things, they can't go away. Right. So how do we put all this together? In, and I think this crisis time is the time that we can begin to do that, to think about that. Just, um, 
one of the things that was implied in, a, in a, a couple of the comments, and you just sort of called it out, is the value of actually engaging the students mm -hmm. in a reflective practice on their own education, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then really listening to what they tell us. Um, we have faculty who've experimented with a first year experience uh, project. I mean, we're, like many of you, we're doing first year experience as a way of bringing folks into college. And the first quarter, uh, the topic is decolonizing education. And I remember the first time I saw that, and, and first, my first thought was which faculty member uh, had the wit and the will and the <laughs> courage to name it. Um, but boy, they had given a lot of thought to it. And what it was is they were asking the students to really think about things like who has access to what education. Mm -hmm. In other words, not to demonize anybody else, just, just to say, look, there may be reasons why mm -hmm. your experience is different than mm -hmm. others' experiences and what are our different experiences in the room. And that we have found that conversation of having students really think about well, what am I doing here and what is my education about, what is it for, even right in the beginning. I think many of us are very used to designing curricula for them that we think is actually really cool. And then being surprised. Right. Right. <laughs> Especially when, since cool is no longer the word that. that, that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No. So that tells you where oh, we are. Man. <laughs> now, my, now I have two young adult sons who do remind me repetitively of my linguistic challenges. Um, why don't we open this up? I see a couple of hands going up. Let's have a, a few comments. And I want to remind you we have six minutes and 14 seconds. <laughs> okay, I'll talk fast. My name is Alton Clayton Pettis. I'm a senior scholar at ACNU. And I want to go back to Millie's point about uh, diversifying the faculty. Yes, we need to figure out where folks are, but we need to ask every single applicant, what is your demonstrated experience with people who are That's different from you? And the answer to that question helps you know who you should hire. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. I, I uh, brought up my kids in Milwaukee in public schools and on purpose, and I, I saw firsthand that, that division. But how can we connect K through 16 and looking at STEM to STEAM? Greg, I'm an art professor, but uh, Thank you, arts back into uh, learning, looking at the lead initiatives, high impact practices, and applied learning versus testing, national testing, K through 16. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Here and then. Um, and I'm Susan Aubrey, Tell Brian, he has a question over there. And uh, I had the opportunity a while back to work with Peter Senge, who was trying to transform corporations. And after a while, what Peter learned was he had to go back to the schools. He had to go back instead of trying to work with the corporations. I was so pleased to hear what Janelle had said about how we train the future or emerging faculty. Right now, we focus on the research, we hire them for mm -hmm. the research, mm -hmm. we don't teach them to teach. Right. We don't teach them what's the purpose of the university. Yeah, I right. think that's a very important change that needs to be made. Right. Brian, you yeah, have come over there, too. Jill Bates, the University of Pennsylvania, talked about diversifying the students, we talked about diversifying the faculty, but Charlene mentioned that it starts with the governing boards. Mm. And we really need to diversify the governing mm. boards. It would be helpful if AACDU would help us understand how best to make that change. Mm. Ron. Um, Ron Tucker from Reed College. I just want to put in a plug for the Posse Foundation. And not to say that every institution can become a Posse institution, but Posse now is moving. The Posse Foundation is an organization that brings together 10 students from inner city high schools majority of whom are students of color, first, most, most of whom are first generation college uh, students, who have for the past 25 years transformed institutions like the Community College, um, through the, the, the programs that they offer. Tassi now has a continuum of research and information that you can rely on to help you. It deals with how to get faculty involved in understanding who these students are and becoming fed mentors for them. 
themselves are changing is when that is For those of you in the back who didn't hear, he was speaking about the importance of connecting with the work of the Posse Foundation. Uh, Tim Deep in Syracuse University, Imagining America. We've been thinking a lot about institutional leadership change and what that means in terms of continuing the vision around this sort of stuff. I sure wish mm -hmm. that I could hear the rich uh, thoughts mm -hmm. about what you're doing to bake in the vision that you are, are, are stimulating in your institutions. I know we don't have time, but it's certainly an important issue. There. Yes, yourself. Good morning. Michelle Cooper with Institute for Higher Education Policy. I appreciate your, uh, your practical suggestions about what works, especially um, for classroom change and institutional change, but as you know, you work within a broader context that is a policy context. And so at some point, I would love to talk to you more about what, how you see infusing these ideas beyond the campus itself and making sure that state policymakers, for example, understand the importance of having equity and excellence tied together. So she just mentioned the importance of, of state policy and the politics that surrounds uh, all of these initiatives of thinking beyond the campus. Um, what we will now do is everybody will move to the next room uh, uh, and we'll have a two-hour workshop on power. Um, I'd like to thank everyone. We, thank you.